You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 377 Common Ground. Our full-length review discussion of the latest episode of The Bad Batch, which left us um, in an an intriguing spot at the very end. Um, Not to jump ahead, but um, to talk about that and so much more is Jonesy. Jonesy, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing well, man. How was your Independence Day holiday weekend? It was good. It was raining, so there wasn't as many uh, fireworks, and so just a, a... A bit of disclosure, I guess. Um, If we hear any, like if you hear the big popping noises, it's because we're recording this on the 5th. And um, people people didn't really catch up. Yeah, people are playing catch up. They didn't get it out yesterday because there was a lot of rain in the air. So if, uh, but it's been pretty quiet. So thankfully that's been okay. But otherwise it was great. How about yours? Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. There's a lot of popping going outside the window here. So people playing a little catch up. But man, it was a, it was a good weekend. A lot of fun to have. And man, we had a lot of, a lot of news last week or last Star year, Wars news, few days. Yeah. yeah, Star Wars news. I mean, besides you getting kicked in the face by one of your kids today. Yeah. Which was pretty epic, not going to lie. <laughs> well, Bill, that's Patreon exclusive right? material right there. So right. <laughs> uh, look for that one here uh, later. But um, and uh, one other thing, too, just as we're recording this, uh, if uh, anybody's joined us with a lot, well, I know we've got some people, I see them here on the live feed. Uh, if you hear the audio, if the audio is OK, let us know if it's not. Either way, uh, we're, we're kind of tweaking a couple things trying to get the the best quality sound that we can. And um, we made some changes. So hopefully uh, we I'm coming in okay and everything sounds good. But if not, let us know if you don't mind in the chat there. So uh, let's jump into the news. And um, this is a pretty big one. Uh, why don't you start off with the, uh, give us an update on the High Republic flagship comic. Yeah, it's cool. They have sold a million copies of the High, Re- High Republic flagship comic. So this is really exciting stuff. I mean, it's showing you, how popular selling a million copies of comics these days really is kind of a big deal. Yes. And it, it just shows you the the quality of the writing. Uh, Charles soul, I think has been writing a lot of that. Is that right? Yes. And uh, again, they've just got really good people doing all sorts of great things right now. And it's just cool to see that milestone and, and, and have that out there for a star Wars comic. It, it feels like it's been a while since we've really had something to really, you know, get enthusiastic about. And I'm, I'm glad the high Republic is starting to take off in that kind of way. Yeah, and I said yes. It's Kevin Scott that's writing the uh, the main. Oh, Kevin title. Scott. That's right. Yeah. Um, My apologies, Kevin no, the, Scott. Yeah. I mean, guy, everything is Kevin Scott twenty four hours a day these days. So, <laughs> my goodness, this he, guy's a beast on Twitter. He is. Uh, they were talking about this. They did a couple of interviews. We didn't even haven't even had a chance to talk. You and I haven't had a chance to talk about uh, all the book signing interviews they've done. They did a couple of those last week. They had one with uh, Claudia Gray, Charles Soule, Justina Ireland and uh, Daniel Jose Older, and Charles Soule was the actual host. He was, like, hosting it. They were taking 200 and something questions trying to get through those. I think they got oh, wow. to, like, four, to be honest. <laughs> um, but uh, they had that. There was some stuff that came out of there. Uh, and just off the top of my head, the, the only really big thing that came from that, since we're talking about news and, and the High Republic, is um, they would not confirm that there are only going to be three phases to the High Republic mm. era. So that's uh, that could bode well for anybody that feels like, hey, you know, this is a really good thing. And, you know, at the end of year three, if it's still doing really well, they've got that sounds like they've not locked themselves or painted themselves in the corner. Right. So. Right. So why is that? So why is that news? Did they refresh our memories or refresh my memory Mm -hmm. early on? Did they say it was just going to be three waves or that was the initial cycle that they had? Or is that just us? Presuming things once again, I think I think we were presuming things based on what Michael Sinclair had said, uh, who's like the uh, what is he like the executive Right. Like yeah. Producer, I guess, of this whole thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, he, you know, when they had come out and said, OK, it was going to be three phases. Uh, they would take us through the next three years. Everybody thought, OK, well, this will be, you know, they started planning this out, mapping it out, thinking, OK, here's how it's going to break down. Um, but no one had really they didn't never really confirmed that it would only be three. This was a mm-hmm. not a confirmation, but it was not a denial either. And there was a lot of quirkiness, a little smirking going on. So it sounded like it um, it has the possibility to go beyond just the three years and the three phases. So that's, that's exciting, especially considering how well the comics are doing. The books are doing well, really well. Uh, the numbers, I haven't seen any numbers yet on the rising storm. 
Uh, and the but, reviews are, but the, the reviews, reviews are, are astronomical. They're fantastic. Yes. And we've been talking about, I know we've been talking about that one forever and said it was going to be amazing. I've already declared it as my favorite Star Wars book. And I know that sounds kind of oh, ever, crazy. Huh? Yeah. Um, it, it, the biggest one for me before this was, I think I, I thought I mentioned on the show, maybe I didn't, but the biggest one for me had always been Heir to the Empire. And mm -hmm. there's, there's a, it's kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark for me where the, the book itself on its own, it's a great book in my opinion, right? right? But the, given the, the timing of it and where we were in Star Wars fandom and all of that, that had, uh, I guess, a little bit of, uh, made it a little bit more special for me. And it's why it's right. always kind of risen to the top. And I kind of put this in that same light. On its own, the book's amazing. It's it's a it w reads really well. There's a lot of this book, The Rising Storm, that reminds me of Heir to the Empire, just in the pacing and how at the end of every chapter, there's just something that keeps you interested, kind of keeps you going to the next chapter, which you want in a great book. Right. And then just the timing of it all. I mean, not to say that we've had a bad run by any means of, of Star Wars <laughs> literature. I think there's been some great stuff out there, but this just feels like it's above and, and beyond even some of the best stuff that we've gotten in the last two or three years. And so for me, I, again, it just, it kind of rose up there, but all that said, it's doing really well. Um, it, the whole thing is, is doing awesome. So to bring it back to the story, a million copies back in 1992, no big deal, right? Right. Comics were selling a million copies left and right. We are living in the days of digital, you know, prints being dead and, uh, right. digital everything. Um, so for it to sell a physical million copies is a significant deal and much less, it's not even like a, it's not a Marvel title. I mean, it's not a Marvel exclusive title or, or a uh, labeled, you know, comic, right. uh, or, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, it's not part of like the Marvel U, right? It's not right. a DC or one of the big players. This is a star Wars comic that just happens to fit under the Marvel label at some mm -hmm. point. So it's been great. It's fantastic news. Yeah. Hey, the news didn't stop there. Did it? We got no. a yeah, we got artwork and an interview with Kevin Scott. Once again, this guy is everywhere for Tempest Runner, which is the audio original is what they are now calling them, not audio drama like we had heard with, uh, with Dooku Lost. Dooku I believe Lost. Is what they were calling it. Right, but we got an awesome cover with Lorna D right on there, right front and center, and a great interview with Kevin Scott where he was talking a little bit about where Lorna D, this picks up right after the Rising Storm. Mm -hmm. And so I think Rising Storm is going to be, you know, required reading. This doesn't come out until September... September? Yes. Come out? Yeah. It's in the fall. I think it's September yeah. in September on there. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like September 7th or something. I'm getting all with Star Wars Visions we're going to talk about here in a minute. All the dates are getting jumbled in my head, but this is a really exciting one. We really liked Dooku Jedi Lost, at least the performances for the most part, really good. And the story was interesting. And for this, it's going to pick up right after Rising Storm. We're going to figure out, you know, she's been tested, you know, with her, where, where she's at with, uh, with the Nihil. She's, I don't want to spoil too much though. I, I, it's really, they, he spoiled a lot of it. So it wouldn't necessarily be spoilers from your, my perspective, but right. I think if you've not read the rising storm yet, we're not even a week removed from it coming out, you know, we'll reserve some of it, but you're going to want to, we're going to want to listen to this book, I think, and and see the challenges that Lorna D is going through and really where do her loyalties lie and what's next for, for that kind of character. Yeah, and not to give anything away, but she's in a very precarious position at the very end of this book, as as many people are at the right. end of this book. Yeah. But her in particular, um, she's making some moves that you're just really starting to question and think like, where, what's her ga end game? You know, what's her game plan here? Uh, and hopefully, we'll get some answers filled um, in this audio book or the what was it? What was audio it? original? Audio original, or uh -huh. we get uh, a better kind of uh, direction, good sense of where it potentially could go at that point. So I'm, I think at the very least, you and I want to know about Lorna D and just what goes through her mind. We, mm -hmm. we only get little, you know, little snippets of her from time to time. And I think she's one of the more interesting characters, but beyond the eye himself, right. But yes. beyond, beyond Mark on row, she's the one that seems to have an agenda and that that's not an idiot about it right. <laughs> effectively. So she's very smart. So again, I think this is gonna be a really good book and it's the position she's in. I think it's, it's a, great environment and setting for this story to happen. So I, I think they've done well here with the establishing where she's at. I think it's going to be neat. Very, yep. really neat. No, I'm excited for it. Um, they've done a great job with those so far. So, and then lastly, uh, not to be outdone, it, it, yeah. it was uh, Saturday. It was, uh, they were calling it Star Wars Visions Day. And I forget, Steph had mentioned where this was at. I just knew they were going to talk about it. I didn't realize it was kind of part of some kind of a, was it an anime convention of some sort or? Yeah, I think it was anime con or something like that. Yeah. Where they had a panel basically, yeah. which was, we were talking about as very peculiar for Star Wars to have a panel at an 
anime convention, which mm -hmm. is, is totally fitting though. I mean, it's absolutely perfect, but it was still just very odd uh, yeah. for that to be. It was just odd to see, not not for it to be odd, but it's just right. odd to see. But this was really cool. Why don't you take us through a little bit about what they yes. what they came out with? So, in and to your point, like it was odd that we would be we Star Wars mm -hmm. would be at a anime convention, but with the news, it makes complete sense. You've got right. essentially nine episodes coming out of a TV series on Disney Plus called Star Wars Visions. They have taken these nine stories and they've allowed these very prominent, well-established creators of anime. And 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 if you guys listen to this show with any kind of regularity, you know that. Both Jonesy and I aren't heavily into anime. There's certain things that I like. I certainly try to keep my ear to the, the ground to hear when things are coming up, that sort of thing. But I'm not into anime as I know a lot of our listeners are and a lot of people are just in general. I mean, it's not a niche thing anymore. They've got entire TV stations or channels dedicated to this stuff now. But uh, there are some pretty big players that they've brought. The cool thing is, and like it or, or not, what they've done is they've allowed the creators to really go out and create whatever they want without restriction, right? They don't have to fit into any kind of a canon uh, timeline or they don't have to worry about what's come before. All they've done is said, look, you've got the label, you have the characters, the title, the characters, the name, do what you do best, which is tell great stories, great visual stories, great emotional, dramatic stories, and do it to the best of your ability and we'll back you up 100%. And what we've got from this is nine stories. And we're not going to go through all of these here. But some of them, if you've seen the trailer, if you haven't had a chance, go check out the trailer. Some of the stuff is just like mind-blowing in terms of like how they got there. Uh, just some of the, the situations you see some, fam some familiar characters in. But then there's a lot of characters that seem like they're not, uh, you know, that it, it could be a character that we know. But there's a right. slightly different take to it, right? And so it looks a little different. He or she or they look a little different. So, but what did you think of the trailer? I mean, I was honestly blown away. Like, it was really great stuff. I've seen a lot of anime from fan projects and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. you could tell, like, the, the, this was a clear cut above and beyond some of the stuff that you see from fan art and all that. These are the big guys in Japan that are cranking this stuff out, the big studios that are cranking this stuff out. Right, yeah. And that's no slight against the, the fan art and stuff out there. Right, not at all. Which is fantastic, especially I think you and I are a huge fan of the, the Tie Fighter one that was viral oh, on yeah. YouTube for a that long time. Great, yeah. But it is something, and it's something to see this just out there in general. And you and I have been talking about what is next for Star Wars, and it really does feel like it is animation. And they've they pushed it in a variety of ways, and we've seen it with <laughs> Galaxy of Adventures. There go the fireworks. <laughs> you get Galaxy Adventures, and now we get this. You're getting these different spins on the classic story and the, the saga. And again, like you said, this is cool because it's taking things we're very familiar with and situations and even character profiles, if not the characters themselves, but at least the character profile and putting a very different spin on them, both visually and from a, from a storytelling perspective. And in the interview, you really get this feel of the, the passion that each of these people has for Star Wars, but also just the excitement and the energy they have in order to tell a story that has that is engulfed in their culture as well. And I think that's mm -hmm. going to be really, really neat to see and just how different it's going to be. Some of them were very peculiar, like seeing basically, you know, what I would call a katana blade. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that looks like a lightsaber, but it still has the shape. It, yep. It's very, very interesting and very different, you know, and, and there's a couple of these in here that are always, that always speak to us, you know, and I think like the elder, I always think of Mike with the elder, right? So, you know, <laughs> passing of a baton to the next generation, master and apprentice, you know, yeah. The, things like that because he sits on his throne wherever but so yeah. some of these are going to be very familiar to us but i think they're going to be really really good the part that i thought was curious about i want to get your tape so they, they technically are calling these short films yeah now if we use i don't know if this is accurate or not, if we use pixar as the example pixar short films of course have been critically acclaimed they've won multiple academy awards you can do a lot with these short form uh, storytelling mm-hmm they have gone anywhere from a minute and a half, two and a half minutes, all the way to like 15 minutes. Yeah. Right. And in and, and, and that wide gamut there, there have been numerous Academy Awards for each of those kind of links all in between. Are we going to see, is it going to be more like that? Something between a five and a 15 minute short film? Or are we actually going to see short film, meaning like a 45 minute type of show or something like that? Because it's really not clear to me what 
what the actual structure is going to be to this series. None of these, yeah. these aren't episodes in a series, right? They're not, they don't appear to be directly connected no. as far as we are aware. Right. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't suggest that at all. But yeah, I, I yeah. um, what do no, you think so, about that? Well, first off, the, uh, the fact that they're not connected, I think is, well, the fact that they, they may not be connected isn't necessarily a bad thing either. Oh, um, absolutely not. I think it's great. If Actually. they were, wow, holy crap, that would be awesome too. Uh, okay. To think about it, like you could just kind of watch these in succession or know that they're all driving each other. I didn't get that impression, but man, that'd be really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the actual time, my gut tells me it's going to be the five to 15 minute mark. The only, uh, the only thing that I would uh, argue against that is you've given these creators, and you brought up a good point that I wanted to touch on as part of this um, mm -hmm. answer these guys, when they showed a lot of the folks up there that were talking about having the opportunity and they don't, you know, they were all translated because most of these are native Japanese speakers. And, right. um, but what they were saying is yes, finally, like I've wanted to do star Wars my entire life, never thought this would ever happen. And now I have the opportunity to tell the story in my medium and not have strings attached, which is, I think that alone is already going to set it apart from anything else we've ever seen. Right. Yeah, that's but a really big deal. Yeah. It is a huge deal because if you're a creator and you've always wanted to get it and tell that star Wars story, if you're landlocked, if you will, because you're not a native speaker, you're not, they realize they've probably acknowledged long ago. I'm probably never going to have an opportunity to do that unless I, you know, get really good at English and my, make my way over to America and all this stuff. And suddenly here it is knocking on the door. Literally they're saying, here's the star Wars franchise. Have fun. Give us something creative. Right. So from that perspective, I wonder if they really took the time, if they wanted to take the time and, and kind of milk it, if you will, and go for like the longer stories. I know I would. Right. Uh, but that said, because it's on Disney plus, because they're not beholden to any kind of timeline, time frame, And to your point, because Pixar has demonstrated you can do a very powerful five minute story that oh my goodness. surpasses yeah. two hour movies with long exposition and character development. I mean, they can do amazing things in a short amount of time. And, they, and they've done it without words. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. You don't need a script. Yeah. Right. No, right. 100%. Uh, so I think that would be, to me, it feels like that's probably where they're going to land is in that five to 15 minute mark. I, again, we didn't get clarification as to what, how, if, if that's true or not, either way, I'll think I'll, I'll be pretty happy. The closest thing that I can even think of, uh, not to really bring this into it was when the matrix came out and they had yeah, that they, animatrix thing that right. came out, right. And we had all those different visions. I think we talked about this when it was first announced that there was, this is what it kind of reminded me of. And even seeing it now, it feels like that. Now that one, I believe was all kind of tied back into original stories. They really didn't have uh, any kind of a, any kind of a, uh, uh, they weren't allowed to kind of do whatever they wanted to visually right. and creatively. They could do it, but they were still beholden to like the actual storyline. This feels a little bit different and maybe even a little more powerful and exciting because they're not. So exactly. Yeah. And Keaton had a, had a comment down there. So they said anthology series in the first look. And I, I think we have mm. to make sure we understand what anthology is though, because we've heard anthology before. Remember, that was what Solo and Rogue One and all of that was supposed to be, this anthology of really, uh, they were they were material that were canon, but they were just individual story, mm -hmm. you know, that, that were out there. But, and, and I'm kind of viewing this as a bit of, kind of like a Forces of Destiny a little bit too, right? That that idea behind it, where you can tell these different stories, but they don't necessarily have to roll into one another, which I think is great because you don't have to worry about the story someone else has told before you either much like you were saying with the overall premise of Star Wars and everything they've got there, but you don't necessarily have to build a cohesive story across all of it. You can pick the thing and you can pick something so small and seemingly insignificant and make something really special about it. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're, we're kind of waxing on about this quite a bit, but it, it's something that's <laughs> really, it's really cool. So September 22nd on business, uh, business, business. <laughs> Disney Plus, right, is going to be the, the date this comes out. Again, no idea if this is going to be released all at once. It sounds like they might be rolling this out over time, which I, I'm actually becoming very, very okay with. Uh, it's working very well for all of uh, Marvel and Disney's comment, yep. uh, comments. Goodness gracious, content overall. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, really exciting. As you can tell, we're, we're, we're over the moon on this one. Yeah, absolutely. I was typing out party in the front, business in the back. Business. Um, all right. Well, new Patreon subscriber. <laughs> well, yeah. segue. Colin <laughs> Shannon has joined the After Dark tier, which is the two dollar tier. Uh, so thank you for joining uh, that, and uh, we'll get to Patreon here in just a little bit. So no, we can't thank you enough for that. So thank you so much, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the, all the backlog catalog stuff that we've got going on and 
everything going forward. So yep. make sure you go check out Chewy and the Porgs, like December 2018. I know. That's the, it's a, it's the, only, thing people, yeah. it's the only thing I would subscribe to. I'd right. go to that. I'd go listen to it and just put it on repeat. Drop two bucks for one month. Join us. Listen to Mike <laughs> doing Chewy and the Porg. <laughs> You can bail out. I don't care. I, t I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know. Just leave a comment. Your... Leave a comment. Let us know you did it. <laughs> yeah. Let us know you did it. You we were the one to... person that bounced in and out just to hear right. that. We just want to make sure Mike knows that it's something very special and he needs to go and do it again. Because <laughs> we've been on his case for almost three years now. <laughs> and also we've got uh, our first $5 uh, Patreon exclusive uh, piece that you did. Congratulations yeah. on that. I finally got a chance to to watch it. Awesome job on on that part, sir. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, War of the Bounty Hunters, the alpha and issue one came out. Uh, Boba Fett has got himself in a pretty special situation by losing Han Solo. So again, this is something we've been very cautious about, you know, the in-between, the storytelling and what happens in between, how much do we want to know? And this one's off to a pretty special start, a pretty good start. It, it's it's engaged me enough to at least give it the, the next episode or the next issue or two to uh to let it develop so i'm interested to see where it goes and the comic the cover art which of course is usually my favorite part of comics anyway <laughs> has been absolutely phenomenal phenomenal all of the variant art is super cool and it is definitely worth just pulling up in the comiXology app and staring at the beauty that is you know these covers because they're just goodness gracious <laughs> they're just really cool but anyway yeah thanks it was a lot of fun it's a short episode guys like 10 to 15 minutes so uh, I hope you guys enjoy that and expect to hear more of that from us and yes. see more of it. It's the first one we've done on video as well. So now that we've kind of got that ironed out, you can now watch our videos on Patreon. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so just quickly, I have everything written out for my first one. All my show notes are done. I've got the video the way I want it. So uh, my plan is to record that this week and release it this week before awesome. Friday. Cause I'm not going to be here. I'm going to leave on Friday. I'm going for a few days. So before Friday, you guys will have that first one. And just so that you know, I'm going to be doing, uh, covering the High Republic comic book series. And this will be the first issue and mm -hmm. uh, kind of breaking that down, giving my thoughts. And I, I, have, I have the benefit of having read, um, you know, all the books, including the one that's not been released, as well as now the sixth issue, which is the, oh, the new storyline. So that's what um, he was waiting on, folks. He yeah. just make sure that the sixth issue got in the loop. That's yep. why it's not late. It's right on time. Right on time. That way I sound like I know what I'm talking about. And I, no, I'm just kidding. Hey, it is very timely and relevant. That's that's all that matters, Albert. Yeah. I got your back, man. That's very true. Thank you. But yeah, I'm excited to do that. It should be fun. So hopefully you enjoy that as well. Man, it is uh, it is the 4th of July over there. <laughs> it really <laughs> is, man. <laughs> I'll just hear it. Shots fired. Shots fired. Okay. Is, I, can't, I can't get this <laughs> noise gate to be sensitive enough without cutting me off. No, you're fine. Yeah, that, that okay. popping loud noise in the background. We'll try to edit that out. Well, no, who am I kidding? I'm not editing that out. We'll just... <laughs> we'll leave it in there. It's part of the, the flavor. Well, I guess that's it. We'll see you guys next right. week. Now, let's talk about... Um, that would have been a full episode. That would have been great. <laughs> we had 23 minutes and just getting into starting to talk about Common Ground. Okay, so give me your thoughts on Common Ground. I've seen a lot of mixed reaction about it, um, but I want to get your thoughts first, and I'll give you mine. Yeah, this was... You know, this this felt like a typical Clone War smash and grab type mm -hmm. of uh, episode which we've had some fears about, but I, there were, the more I thought about it and the more, you know, the, the subsequent viewings of this, I had a little different appreciation for it because there were certain things I am interested in. I got kind of different questions coming to mind. You know, it was interesting to see the reactions of the clones about what it meant to go into the capital of the CIS, right? The, the, the Confederacy of Independent Systems. And like, it really kind of tests their loyalty of sorts, right? It, it just doesn't feel right. It's weird. It's why are we... Why are we helping the enemy, basically, when this is just the the economy or the, not the, well, the economy too, sure. but just the, the political spectrum and the who are allies and who are foes, everything has just been turned on its head. And this is the, you know, the reshaping of where the, you know, where the galaxy is at large. And it's just in this this state of change. And, you know, who are who are enemies before might become friends now. And and we find a common banner to to go under. I thought even the title of the episode was really, really cool because what we've, I think what we've noticed is that the, the titles tend to have dual meanings. Double meanings, yeah. Yeah, sometimes a third meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and this one I think definitely had a couple of different angles of that. And it was neat without Omega to see what happens to the clones without Omega. And also I like that we saw even tech getting a little more, you know, friendly of sorts. And 
and some of the reactions. And again, some of these little moments we'll talk about here, especially towards the end of the episode. Uh, but I thought it was, I thought it was okay. It, it wasn't, I don't think it was not the, one of the more interesting or exciting episodes, but I still liked it quite a bit. Uh, and I actually thought the droid was hilarious. I thought it was perfect. It reminded me very much of Phoebe waller Cates and, oh, and her GSA. performance. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus as, uh, as you know, L3 and very much in the same kind of vein. And mm -hmm. I thought it was a lot of fun. Actually, this is the first episode, Albert, I got to be honest with you. I started no like noticing, uh, mistakes in the animation, like the droid had walked away already, but yep. then in the next frame, the, the droid He's was back. there. Yep. Yeah. The, the Mandalorian key fob, like just randomly disappeared out of the droid's hand all the time. It was just, it was there one scene and then you cut to the next, it was gone. Mm. I did like that. They used a little Mandalorian key fob. I thought that was neat. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't catch that one. I caught the droid walking away. Cause I thought, wait a minute, there was there two. And then we round right. it and I was like, Oh wait, no, just the uh, editing mistake, which they yep. could have, they could have just put that, move in that line where she says move in to attack or get move into position they could have right. put that before that and it would have been just fine but i get why they did it It was more dramatic to go to flip it but if you get a chance watch that scene you'll know what we're talking about there yep. at the very right, beginning so what about you what do you think about it it was uh, well so i felt like it was okay like it wasn't uh it wasn't my favorite episode of all of them but that's not slack or flack either i mean i i there were th like you um i was able to watch it and kind of get a at least my own personal feeling for what they were trying to do and for me, it just kind of boiled down that this was a an opportunity to see the Bad Batch for the first time this series. Honestly, I wouldn't, we've been talking about how they keep making mistakes and they're not in their element. And that this is all very much in their element. Like they were on, you know, a well-oiled machine and working like they had been normal in the past. And so that was exciting to see them be like this Delta Force kind of thing or the, you know, commandos or the uh, Green Berets or whatever special right. armed forces that you want to throw in there. Um, I just felt like at times we got pieces of that in the past on these missions, but there was always something that was new and different to them. And now they, although they weren't necessarily fighting clankers and which is kind of where their wheelhouse is, the fact that they were doing a special ops mission and they didn't have to worry, I guess, so much about a child. Um, yeah, they were still a man down and not having crosshair there, but it just felt like they were able to shine at least in this episode in every way. Like they really didn't make any mistakes. It was like mission in, mission out, get in, get out kind of thing, uh, which it was good to see. Like, I felt like they kind of needed that. It wasn't, you know, it was, again, there was nothing in here that was hugely jaw dropping. Although I say that and who knows, Singh's probably going to be <laughs> like some main character somewhere else. Or, you know, right. the fact that they've released him now has set off a chain of events that's going to, you know, come back in, in, in season two or something, who knows. But at least on the surface, it didn't feel like there was anything too pivotal outside of the fact that we now maybe know what um uh, omega's special power is but we'll, yeah, we'll come back to that yeah. in a little bit too i think it's still kind of to be determined but um, we finally at least have a clue i think finally yeah i think i think we're at least given we've give, been given something to, to kind of work off of uh the only the only other thing that i had i guess a problem was it was omega being grounded again um and it was called common ground but that it just felt like she was let put behind uh, again even though she had already kind of proven herself i thought but maybe not I get it. We'll we'll get into that here in a little bit. I understand where Hunter's coming from and, and just kind of being overprotective as a parent. You kind of do some of that stuff, right? You say, oh, no, no, this won't, you know, I trust you. And then something happens. You're like, crap, I can't trust you. I've got to put you back here because I know what's best for you. And then you realize I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, went back right. on my word. So I get that. I mean, that seems like that's a very realistic thing to happen uh, as a parent. So um, before we go any further, just the, the Patreon uh, topic, uh, I had called it the old ways are done. And we've brought this up. There is a reoccurring theme here. And I thought in this one more than anything, and I'll, you, you kind of hit it all right out of the beginning, was the fact that they were embedded with or embedded in a mission that they were having to go and serve the people they were once fighting against. Right. And that immediately when I heard that, and, and this comes up a few times, especially from Echo, who has every right to be upset about this, the fact that they were doing that. Uh, the first thing I thought of was Saul Guerrero's comment in the very first episode of The Bad Batch saying that the old ways are done. And so I think for Patreon, what I want to do is just kind of get into and kind of talk, explore some of the instances we've seen that now in the first, what, uh, eight episodes? What are we? Nine. Nine yeah. episodes, yeah. Nine episodes of where have we seen that? Because it does seem to be, among other other themes, this is one of the more prevalent reoccurring themes that we're con continuing to see. And I want to maybe even speculate on what else we... Uh, I don't think it's going to end, right? I think this is going to continue to happen. So where Actually, does that go? This was the 10th episode, if you can believe that. Is it? I, yeah. 
I've already lost count. Wow, 10th episode. My goodness. I know. We're, we're almost done with this. All right, well, let's, let's step through this. Uh, I know we're almost yeah. done. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we've got plenty of stuff to talk about. Let's right. uh, start. In, because the opening scene was we finally got the – this. Uh, we were all expecting – I thought this was going to be like the finale, right? Because we thought, you know, they got walkers and there's, you know, ground forces and they're going in. Turns right. out that really wasn't the case, which is fine. But we got to return back to Raxus, which we hadn't been there. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know. Clone Wars? Yeah, it's been a long time. I'm trying to think if there was anything in the books. I don't recall anything, but either way, yeah. um, going back to Raxus, and we start with this, um, what was it Captain Bragg is her name? Captain Bragg, right. I, I like how they give them names that like mean something, right? Like there's right. A, you can kind of twist it into there's she's a bragging, boasting in yeah. some way. But uh, And she was. She's kind of given her speech about how, you know, the Empire is here and they want to protect them. And we all know where this is going, right? They're strong arming these systems into kind of joining them. They're not really giving them an option. Uh, well, and, they give they give them the option. Sure. It's, just a very, it's choose now or we'll go ahead and, and then we'll give you the option that you're going to pick. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. They they do give them an option. It's just not the options you would want um, sometimes. Right. But we know this is happening. We know that the Empire is coming in. They're pretty much giving you no options if they are. And uh, making sure that you join their forces and in return, it's, you know, you're maybe getting protection if there's something that your planet or system provides that's beneficial to the Empire. You're probably in a good scenario, a good uh, situation to kind of benefit from it. So it's a mutual benefit. But if you're not, the Empire just wants to ensure that they don't have to worry about you. And so they're going to, you know, they may take everything from you and not give you anything in return. They may not give you all the protection and everything they've provided, Right. Um, and that's what's happening here. We're starting to see the beginnings of that. And this doesn't sit well with uh, Senator Singh, who is a separatist uh, senator. He seems like he's a, he got a good head on his shoulder. So he's probably one of the good guys who, unfortunately, was on maybe the wrong side of the war, right? Right. This fictitious war is set up sold, made of war. Sold a bill of goods, perhaps. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And uh, now as this isn't sitting with him, because at the, end, at, the bottom, at the end of the day, Bottom line is he does care about his people and he wants, he can't in good justice and good faith do this and breaks away from that speech midway through. And the minute he did that, I thought, okay, well, he's done. They're going to kill him. I didn't really, right. you know, they were going to arrest him for sure, but I thought for sure they'd just be done with him and, and put him out. But what really sets it off is they are the, was it Captain Bragg says they're going to impose a curfew right. quote, for their own protection, <laughs> uh, which is not it. I mean, it's, we know there probably, there's probably uprisings that are happening. The people are un, un, unsettled and there's a lot of unrest. And so they don't want to have to deal with that. So they're just going to impose a curfew. I think we saw curfews and rebels as well. Very did. Yeah. Yep. So it's not uncommon for them. This is what they were doing to kind of keep quote the locals in line. Um, and in return, she kind of says that Raxus is going to flourish once more. So having been ravaged and war torn by, uh, the Clone Wars, this is an opportunity for them. So they're, they're almost playing to, it goes back to that whole Germany thing, right? With World War II, where mm -hmm. they were in so such dis despair that somebody suddenly comes in and says, we're going to make everything wonderful again. And they get the buy-in of the people. This is exactly what the Empire is trying to do. They're trying to take advantage of the fact that there's so many of these separatist colonies that have been ravaged and not doing so well now. And here we are, we're the great savior. We're going to come in and keep you safe. Just need to join us, give us all your stuff. And, you know, maybe they'll follow through on that. But what... Tell me, I guess, your thoughts as you're seeing all this, because it is it is the inklings of the beginning of the Galactic Empire, uh, more of it, which I think is exciting to see. Right, yeah, I think this is also an example of, you have you have a separatist system, the, and the Republic won the war, and so you were already fighting against this entity, and now you are, you call yourself whatever you want. You can call yourself the Republic, you can call yourself the Empire. The, uh, the occupationists are still in your world now. And so they're trying to convince these people and convinces, again, we lose this, use this very loosely because it's just not the case, but you, you have this uphill battle against you already. And, but you've got to break the will effectively of these systems. And, and where are you going to start? You, you really should start right at the heart of it, right? So where did it all, you know, I don't know if it began there, but where was it centralized, right? And I don't remember the name of the, of the, the city in Raxus, but this was the capital of the CIS. Raxalon. Raxalon, there you go. So this was the capital. And so you need to go in, you need to establish yourself there and show that you are there. Now, granted, the Empire's being pretty intelligent about it on the surface of, you know, we're here to help, we're here to rebuild, we're here to establish, you know, peace and order. But at the same time, I mean, it looked like the city was doing all right. I mean, again, yeah, right. the capital cities don't necessarily take all of the damage in Star Wars, at least. But 
it's a they just they, they quickly just lose the patience for it the empire doesn't going to spend a lot of time they're just going to go straight to the iron will now i will say these walkers are the most stealthy walkers i think i've ever seen in my life you know where they all of a sudden they're just behind <laughs> everybody. whoa wait a minute we didn't hear that coming yeah man they are man ninja man they are amazing they really but, are but yeah it's a it was cool to see raxus it was interesting to see it so intact though and I, did, I was conflicted about how I felt about Singh, the the the, the senator, because really the they were the they were the bad guys effectively of, mm -hmm. of sorts. And now, granted, who were the actual bad guys? There's a ton of debate with that, right? Yeah. And I think that's where we've we've always been challenged at with uh, with the Clone Wars in general. You know, the the Republic wasn't altruistic, of course, at all. But you know, it was interesting to see the other side of it. And one character I really liked seeing through all of this was actually watching Echo through all of it you mentioned a little bit earlier and we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go but that was a really interesting one to see how he took kind of this journey through this mission as well and not that it was real developed or anything like that but it was interesting to watch echo because like you said aside from hunter's initial reaction we didn't really get much reaction from the other guys mm -hmm. yeah i think record makes like one comment hunter makes a couple comments here and there but yeah. yeah this is not sitting well with echo at all and again rightfully so given what he's been through right absolutely um so it's um, and the other thing that called that was called to mind for me was that whole you know fear will keep the locals in line, right? You start hearing about right. This is all Tarkin's. Uh, do you remember Tarkin's doctrine from yeah. the Tarkin novel? Right. Uh, that's there was some of that in here. It was almost like she was kind of waxing that, uh, which I, I want to go back and reread now because I'm curious as to whether or not they're kind of using that as a blueprint for some of these uh, the speech or maybe the propaganda that they're using. But anyways, um, in that uh, that speech itself. It did feel like it was kind of more of the fear, you know, fear will keep the locals in line speech or message that we got from uh, A New Hope. But um, right. GS8 uh, is his droid and, you know, he kind of tells her, I guess they had some kind of prearranged agreement here about what would happen if he was ever captured because, yeah. you know, he tells her, hey, follow through on the orders and I'm paraphrasing here. And so once he's arrested, she scurries off, she comes back, then scurries off again. No, that's part of the the mess up there on the <laughs> animation and um, she heads out and she basically calls in a distress call saying that to her master, I guess, or whatever had been um, in prison and they needed some help. And so lo and behold, we kind of figured it's going to be a call out to, to Sid or the bad batch exclusively or directly. But uh, from there we cut over to the streets of Ord Mantell and it looks like they're coming back. Like they're eating Mantell mix. I'm wondering if this is, it feels like this is right after the Cad Bane episodes. Like they just got back. Right. And tradition's tradition. They rescued Omega, so it's time to celebrate. So it was good to see it. I like the way he was just kind of carrying her on his shoulder, right? All those kind of physical moments with him and, and her are, are, are really good. And there's been, there were other ones in this one too. In fact, I'm starting to notice a lot of stuff that happens off uh, the main focal point in these episodes between Omega and or Wrecker. Yep. We didn't, it was like two episodes ago, there was one where you were focused on tech and I think Hunter looking at bombs or something. And Omega's running off and she kind of waves at them as they're going by and Wrecker waves back and they just kind of make this little, you know, hey, hey, how are you doing? I got to go, got to go. And they kind of, you know, pass by right. each other. Stuff like that is is really cute because it's, um, you know, it's it's natural. It's it's authentic for kids. They are sometimes they can be in the middle of something serious and the next thing you know, they're, uh, you know, playing around or having a quick joke or in this, uh, you know, they just came off a really tense mission, but the most important thing is getting that ice cream afterwards and <laughs> sitting on Uncle Wrecker's shoulder and, and having fun. But all that was really good stuff as they were yeah. kind of coming back. Well, and I liked it too when she had dismounted from Wrecker's shoulder, I guess. You know, Tech actually held out his arms to catch her if she stumbled or fell. And so it's nice to see Tech kind of changing a little bit. They're very, very subtle <laughs> right. again, but it, but it's really cool to see tech kind of warming up a little bit here too. Yeah. Yeah. Th these are big moments for tech, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> right? Small things like that are huge. So, yeah. uh, but, uh, yeah. So Hunter says that they, uh, they need to take a break, uh, that they need to lay low. And so that coupled with the fact that they're, it, it sounds like they haven't really done anything. And I think he's got the fear in him now. Right. I mean, we talked about this. He was, yeah. It's real now. It's real now. Exactly. Because um, Omega looks fine. It doesn't look like she needs to rest. I think Wrecker says it, or somebody says. Yeah, Wrecker. Yeah. She looks fine to me. She looks fine to me. Um, but I think he was just being overprotective here. He's been scared 
they lost her now um, in a big way. Uh, he probably feels responsible for that in some to some extent. And although he was all about, hey, you know, this is your place, you're part of the squad, he relegates her to sitting back this this episode, right? It was right. almost like he was almost like pushing the good soldiers follow orders. I mean, she almost says that out of her mouth, right? Mm -hmm. To some extent. Um, so, well, she was she was pretty defiant, a little bit bratty in this episode too. Yeah. So it would not have been out of character. Well, not totally out of character for her to throw that back in his face at some point, but. Oh, that would have been a little bit if she had said that back. Oh, good that, soldiers. That would, that would, well, yeah, that would have been, hmm, that would have been a knee to the groin. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would have been, that's the teenage years for children. when they're, Right. She's not quite there yet. Not she's there. not, she's not Bobo yet. <laughs> yeah. It's coming though. Uncle or uh, daddy Hunter. Don't worry. It's coming. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So at that point we're, we're back at Sid's place. They walk in and Sid, this is where she kind of tells him, Hey, we, they, she's got a new mission. It's back on Raxus. They all kind of look at each other like, what in the world? Uh, I think later on, Hunter makes that comment about, I, or maybe it was Hunter, but someone says, I think I was always, I, I always knew, I thought we would always come back to, or come to Rex, go to Raxus, never like this. In right. their minds, they would go be going to Raxus to storm the city, storm the right. city. Yeah. Tear it down and, you know, liberate anybody that's there or whatever, end, but end the war. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're all a little concerned. This is where Echo kind of first expresses some inter uh, disinterest of or concern about really the separatists like what are we what's going on here and and again it goes back to that you know the old ways are dead they've, they've got to adapt or they die with the past and this is a huge right. example of that um but hunter um is like no he shuts it down we're not doing this there's, there's no way this is crossing the line right we're for hire we're indebted to you because there's you know we've racked up debt from mantel mix and whatever else but we're not going through with this one um, and she reminds him of the debt that's owed and she kind of, you know, I guess sways him, persuades, persuades him into, to kind of do, and he breaks away from her. And, um, but really the most important thing that happened is we had a new nickname. <laughs> Bandana. <laughs> Bandana, not, not dark and broody. <laughs> dark and broody. Did, she does reiterate that one, but yeah, Bandana is now catching on. Yep. I wonder, that was our, okay. So what are the other uh, muscles? Maybe that's going to be one for Wrecker. Right. Uh, Echo. What would she give him? Droid? No, um, that's too personal. Yeah, screwdriver? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> walking I terminal? I don't well, know. <laughs> I don't now know. We're just, now we're just going to Multi-tool. How about that? We'll call him multi-tool. Multi -tool. Swiss Army knife? Swiss Army knife. Is there a Swiss in the Switzerland? In, no. No. There's... Um, so, where are we? Boy, that got derailed really quickly. Uh, oh, You're so welcome. yeah. So, Hunter, he, um, he, he gets away with Sid. He's kind of like, hey, let me go talk to you in, in kind of private here. And I think this is where he kind of is trying to tell her, look, you know, normally wouldn't be against this, but the fact is, you know, uh, Omega is, uh, you're sending us basically to go in the middle of a bunch of Imperials who right. are after, or I guess he's, you know, he's protecting Omega more than anything. And it's just, this is not a risk that he's willing to take. And so as a counter offer or as a solution, she offers, well, then just leave her here with me and I'll take care of her and you can go do your mission, which... It's probably all good for him, right? I mean, he feels like, okay, he must trust her enough. Although he says no, he, he doesn't trust her. Right. He right. doesn't want to do it. But she's like, well, but it's in my best interest for you to come back and pay, get so I can get paid. Yes. So I will take care of her because that's in my best interest that you do your job. And we, yeah. have, an, we have a healthy relationship, basically. Yep. So, I mean, it, it all kind of works out in the end, I guess. It, it makes sense that they would go through with this. But the unfortunately, the person that has to suffer is Omega because she's uh, doesn't take the news very well that she has to stay back and she's not allowed to go. And yeah, she kind of just throws that in her face about this is a soldier's orders. You need to follow orders. Yeah. She was very, very direct with that. And not that that doesn't make sense, but I think some of it was the, where she was like, I was part of the squad. I mean, he has reiterated that she was part of the squad. So this mm -hmm. really feels like getting the rug, you know, yanked out from underneath you. And it's, it's really kind of catching her off guard. Cause she's, you know, getting, all gussied up and ready to ready to go back out and ready to start the next mission. And she's all into it. And that's a, that's kind of a gut shot for her. And you kind of felt for it because there's no reason she wouldn't expect to go back on these missions. And I don't, she clearly didn't understand the line of reasoning behind that decision either. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure Anakin's somewhere out there going, yeah, cry me a river. This actually, there was a lot of similarities <laughs> with all of that too. Right. Right. 
And I mean, I'm, what I mean lot. is him <laughs> trying to get his master rank, right? He never, he could, right. he was like part of the group, but not really part of the group. And this is kind of similar, some parallels here, not to that same extent, but. Right. We want you to sit on the circle, but we want you to get your earmuffs on whenever we talk about something. Yes. Real important. You can go sit at the little kid's table. <laughs> um, all right. So from there, uh, Sid basically keeps her back and she's got a special mission for her, which is cleaning. Not super exciting. And this all leads to something a little bit later. All right, we jump into... Um, oh, wait, you forgot, yeah. man. Alfonso and his friend are fighting, as usual. No, oh, I Alfonso. cracked up. They fought They fought like two or three times this episode. I cracked up every single time. I absolutely love it. I don't know why. It's so dumb, but it's so great. I looked up the character, the actors, uh, voice actors, and they're two of the main guys from Critical Role. That um, Have you ever watched that podcast? I think it's a, mm -hmm. or it's a... I don't know if it's a podcast or a YouTube channel where they play Dungeons & Dragons. It's huge, hugely popular. And I think that's the one where they bring on celebrities to play as well. And so they record these gaming sessions and you can watch them. Pretty cool stuff. But uh, the, the voices are two of the main people from that, uh, that show. So. Interesting. Uh, there's, um, okay, so we get uh, jump over into hyperspace and they're on the way to Raxus. And uh, we learn that they're going to head outside the capital of Rax, uh, Raxalon, which is typical for Star Wars. We never land in the main city. We always land a couple miles away and, and walk in which is right. fine. Uh, but this is where Echo consider he, you know, he expresses some more concern about, Hey, these are the separatists and tech reminds him uh, that he won't shut up about it. Uh, which again, I, you know, I'm still waiting for that, that turn in their relationship and it just hasn't happened yet, but right. they're still going at each other. And I think tech's probably tired of hearing about it. He just seems so like, whatever, you know what I mean? Like he, he it's whatever the mission is, is the mission. Yeah. He may throw a fit about it or have some comments, but at the end of the day, he's not going to, really push back where somebody like Echo's like, Hey guys, I don't know if you've been keeping up on current events, but you know, <laughs> I just got tortured by these people. They are not, not these exact people, but this, by this faction. And here I am going into this mission. We're all going into this mission and we have to go save one of them. He's thinking, let that person die. Right. Who cares? They were on the wrong side of the war. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, t t from that perspective, yeah, I think he's got every right to, to kind of express concern and he doesn't even trust him. He feels like, I think he says this a couple of times that he's pretty sure that they're going to backstab him and that this is all elaborate trap or a ruse for, for them to kind of, you know, get back at them at some point here. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he's wrong to have that concern or have that underlying fear about it either, because clearly, clearly other things haven't gone to spec every time. So why not? And yeah, like you said, he's got every reason to distrust these folks. There's mm -hmm. no, no reason at all, but yeah, I'm waiting for the day where, Echo pulls out the backhand on tech, but you know, tech is just all about the mission. Like you said, it's just, okay, we have a mission. We'll see how to get it done. No, here's the technical reasons of why we should do this or do that, you yeah. know, and that's all there is to it. There's no emotion to it at all. And I was glad to see that from Echo that, you know, that there is that underlying, you know, uh, experience and fear and emotion behind his eyes. And you can, you can kind of see it. I think they did a really good job of bringing that across with just the way that he's looking down and just the shifting of the eyes. You can tell how uncomfortable he really is with this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at, at that point, they land on Raxus in the forest somewhere there. And they meet up with GS8 for the first time, who turns out to be the client. And even that is, pretty, <laughs> you know, their client is now a droid. They've right. been fighting droids almost their entire life, literally their entire life. Although clearly not the same no. kind of droid. No, but, you know, I mean, they probably do have a... They probably don't have a uh, big interest or uh, attachment to droids. Uh, there's probably there's, right. there's definitely a reason to distrust them, although, like you said, it's not really the same model. Um, and there were certainly droids in, you know, in the uh, the Republic. But oh, sure, yeah. So there, it shouldn't be unfamiliar for them. But yeah, the fact that it's probably a separatist droid, you know, I would think okay, maybe it's got some weird programming, or it's I mean, that's probably where it's going from because she even says it's it's against my programming to even uh, was it betray you guys or whatever. Yeah, because, betray allies, I think. Mm -hmm. We're not allies. Yeah. I like that. Who Somebody said, uh, we don't care. Just take us where the center is being held. Like, let's get this over with. Like, I yeah, think it was Echo. Or, or it whatever. was Echo. Was yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, Echo pulled the gun. It was like, stop it. We don't give any kind of care. <laughs> yeah. Let's just get this over with. Right. Uh, we flash back over to Ord Mantell, and Omega's moping around because, you know, she's, I think she tells Sid that life isn't fair, and Sid tells her that, yeah, it's true, life isn't fair, and that she needs to do something about it if she doesn't like it. Which is interesting because I thought, all right, is that going to play out a little bit later down the road? I she think it will. Called, she called her out hardcore too. Yeah. If you weren't so weak and they didn't have, if you weren't such or a liability. She said helpless. Yeah. Basically just a liability, right? And mm -hmm. and she was 
giving the kids some harsh realities of, you know, don't sit around and mope about it, you know, make a difference, you know, take care of things yourself and show them why you shouldn't be left behind. Yeah. And, and that was, and that certainly, it got some looks from Alejandro or what are we calling him? Cliff and Alfon Alfonso. Alfonso. Yeah, that's right. From Robot Chicken. <laughs> uh, it, it got some looks from both of them. They both looked at her like, you know, they were shaking their heads like, that's not how you talk to a kid. Hmm. And, you, and she never apologizes for it. I was, I went back and listened because I was like, well, maybe she wouldn't said sorry. No, she never apologized, which is, I guess, fine. I mean, she, what she said wasn't untrue. It's just her bedside manners or her parenting skills probably need a little bit more polishing up on. But, but it's, you know, I, I wonder if that, uh, I don't think, I don't think Omega's ever felt helpless though. That's the thing, right? I don't, I don't think in her mind she ever has ever felt helpless. And um, I'm wondering though, if that somehow gets into her head, this idea, if you don't like what's happening, go change it. I wonder if that's going to set her on a path at some point uh, to make a decision that she normally wouldn't make. Um, and, and so maybe there is some good advice that came out of all of this, but um, we'll see. It'll, it'll be interesting if it's something more than just, you know, paying off debt and, and being a, a whiz at the, at the space chess, yep. at the, the Jarg. There's um, Blake Weaver. Hey guys, long time listener. Thanks for all you do. Hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah, no, th thanks for everybody else too. There's been, uh, we're seeing some new folks in here and some folks that are always in here. And, and we love that you're always in here. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. But uh, yeah, no, thanks for, for popping in. Okay. Um, we get over to uh, Raxalon City itself. I don't remember if they ever gave this thing a name in the Clone Wars. It I makes, don't remember. It was just Raxus, I think. Right. But yeah, I don't think we actually ever, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I know. Yeah. But I just thought I was like, hmm, I never heard that city before. But, um, you know, Sing's pretty well guarded. And this is where Echo confronts GS8 about being set up. Um, and this is where she makes that comment about, hey, my program, program, it doesn't even allow me to betray my, my allies. Um, right. And the first step is Hunter says, we got to take out the camera system. Makes sense. Uh, they use GS8 as bait to kind of go out there, wave her arms, run back in there. They take those guys out. Uh, but here's one thing that was interesting. And I know I've, I haven't really seen a lot of talk about this, although I've been pretty busy this weekend. So I haven't had a chance to to kind of follow some of the the, the people that I, I do follow. Um, but this idea that they, they were really are, I mean, all of their blasters were set to stun. Yeah. They didn't yeah. really kill anybody. I mean, and they've done their share, right? I mean, they're not saying they haven't in, the, in this, the show isn't, uh, has not, um, pulled the punches, uh, if you will, on the violence. I mean, you think about crosshair and, and killing those people in cold blood and, and all of that. They certainly have gone there. They're not here now. And I, I, I just wonder if it's really in the back of their minds, they realize that these are their brothers and maybe in the back of their heads or maybe off camera. We don't know yet. They've already talked about it. at some point. We, we're going to have to free these guys or liberate them or it's part of some bigger plan. But they certainly were set, uh, no pun intended, set on not killing them and using the stun uh, guns uh, setting in this episode. Right. But what did you what did you think there? Did you catch that? Yeah, actually, it was, it's funny you bring it up because Steph and I were talking about how this should be one of the questions of the week. So you might actually get two questions of the week this week, folks. Mm. Uh, one was, you know, why were they set to stun the entire time, as well as, a, as another one. Where I came to, and you know me, I'm much more practical about these things. It made a lot of sense to use stun early on because they're trying to be covert. They're trying to not make a lot of noise. And I don't, they don't, it sounds like they don't have silencers in Star Wars. They don't know what those are. But it sounds like stun is about the closest you can get to it. Hmm. So that's that's about as close as I got to it. And then why did they keep using stun is kind of the other side of the question. Because by the time they were done with it, they just uh, did they just forget to switch them back over, or was that really all that intentional? But you're right; they've not pulled any. They've not been bashful about taking out clones left and right. And at this point, we don't even know if they're still all clones or not, but probably mostly clones. Right. And but that was about the. That's about the far as I got, but she was very bummed if this didn't come up. So I'm glad that you brought it up. So it didn't seem like we were forced into square square pegging around a hole. But yeah, that, that's where I came out to. Did you think it was any more than that, or was it just? No, uh, I I don't I don't think it was any more. Um, I don't think it was anything like oh we're censoring violence or anything. Like I said, they've no. they've already made it a point to to show that they're not afraid to show violence, and 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 the oh way they gosh. did it was probably the best way to do it too, right? I mean, it's always for me, it's always scarier or more intense when you don't necessarily directly see it right and you see the reaction of other people through their eyes i mean that's and that's kind of what we got with crosshair when kind of even though it was a helmet it was just kind of uh, eerie 
uh, when that happened. So I don't think it was that. I do think it was probably along the lines of, hey, these are oh, two things. One, stealthier. Uh, I went back and listened to it. And yeah, the sound of a blaster is so prevalent, right? And especially during this time, I don't think the the Republic nor the Separatists or the Galactic Empire is running around on stun all the time. We saw it only one time ever in, in for a number of years in, in New Hope, and it didn't really come up again until much later on. Um, and so I think one, they're not in the, uh, the mindset to use this at all. And so it's not, a, it's not a loud sound. It's not as loud as a blaster. Um, you'd probably don't have the, this, if you miss, you're not probably blowing a hole and there's smoke <laughs> and everything else. Right. right. But there's, there's probably tactical advantages for using this. The only thing I would question is when they came in and barged in and I'll jump ahead just for this piece, but when they came in and barged into, um, rescue Singh, they did not take out Captain Bragg. And she's clearly a Galactic Empire person, right? So, uh, oh, they you did. know, well, they, they stunned well, they her, but she it. came oh, back, okay. right? And that, so yeah. some of that is, okay, some of that I get it. It's probably story and yeah, they want to keep her alive. She's going to be a reoccurring character and all that. But you know, so even what about if, this? All right, sorry to interrupt, but so let's spin this around a little bit. That just yeah. came to mind. What if it's to show the senator that they aren't killers and that they're, well, they're not, I mean, they're kind of mercenaries in this, but the 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 new good guys are not necessarily going to go in their guns blazing and just taking everybody out and the new way isn't going to be so much like the old way of just blasting your way through everything mm. i mean in close quarters that makes a little more sense i think in that situation stunning those people instead of killing them in cold blood in front of a senator who presumably hasn't really been subjected to all the violence at least close quarters but why they would do that later whenever they're getting bombed and everything else from the other walkers and shot at clearly without stun on a little, little more difficult to, to play with that. Uh, but that was another little tiny little thing I thought maybe yeah. was potentially, you know, something you could throw in there. But Well, no, I would agree that um, what you say is sound. Like it makes sense. I don't know that they, they did that. I mean, I, I think, you're, I think your, your idea or reason is probably good, but I don't I think that, that was behind it all. Is it a, yeah. is it a huge thing? No, I don't think it's a huge thing, but I was thinking this is very, uh, t to the point earlier that I made about how this was kind of them in their element. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, you know, this whole episode played out like a Tom Clancy novel, right? Uh, very similar to one of the um, episodes in season seven when they stormed, what was that? Where they stormed that one base and, um, and we got that one continuous shot of, of, the, of uh, the Bad Batch in the, kind of in their element again. Very yeah. similar to that. Uh, but it, 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 even after they had stunned her, like locking her, I mean, there was no time. I get it. They were rushed or whatever, but I don't know. I just, it feels like they probably should have just done, did her in and, and be, be done with it. But I, mean, I get like, it. There's reason. Like, why not? Right. Right. I mean, she's already, she's already down and you know, it's, she's not going to, they're not cold blooded murderers, but at the same time, uh, they, I wouldn't put it past them. I wouldn't judge them if they had, I guess, maybe just given what they've gone through and what they're going through right now. But yeah, I mean, the troopers weren't going to exactly switch to stun or anything to your point earlier, right? Right. Yeah. They're not going to go switch over. So all that said, but no, you were not alone. Tactical. No, you were not alone, my friend. Right. right. If you were, if you were wondering if we were wondering, yes, we were like, why are they stunning everybody? Um, uh, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say it was more tactical in their approach and more than anything, probably more than that the risk of hurting uh, more of the brothers probably goes against their long-term plan, which is to hopefully liberate them and free them in some way. Right. So we'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm trying to think where we were now. Uh, Cause we had completely lost my train of thought and oh, my track moving, moving towards the escape aspect of it. Oh, yeah. So tech slices into the security camera system. D he's doing what he does really well. They split up echo and record go to the top, although we never see them. Next thing, they don't come back again until they join up and, and they're trying to get out of there, which is fine. We just right. assume they're out there kicking butt on the first two levels. Yeah, and they then, tripped, a, tripped an alarm at some point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's how we know they're still out there. Uh, and then Hunter Tech and GS8 take the main floor on the lower level. Uh, and this is, again, where I felt like it was very Tom Clancy-ish. Yeah. Um, and they got to kind of be in their element in going in and trying to free them or free uh, Senator Singh. Um and this is a, there's an interesting moment there where Hunter's telling, I mean, he's kind of call, talking back or behind him to Tech and says that he wants him and Omega to, he gives him an order. I forget what the order is, but him and Omega and Tech, yeah. very Tech-like says, 
you know, uh, that would be impossible because she's, you know, not here. Right. Um, but I think Maybe. this is, this is part oh. of him. Yeah. <laughs> this is part of the subconscious part of Hunter where in his, if he was thinking thoroughly, if he wasn't thinking with his emotion or thinking with his heart and thinking with his mind, there's no reason why he would not have brought Omega given what had all happened. And she's been able to prove herself. Um, so this just kind of, you know, for me, it kind of solidified this, uh, the idea that this wasn't really his, uh, all if had that not happened in the last few episodes, she would be there. And his subconscious was saying, didn't even realize, didn't remember, um, because there would be no good reason why she wouldn't be. And so it was kind of a wake up call for him, I think at that point, but how did you take that, that scene? And when he calls out to gives the order for him and, uh, yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of sweet. It was, I mean, you could hear the disappointment in his voice and he, he was kind of beside himself. Our Hunter was beside himself. They didn't remember that or recall that she's just, like you said, she's just been part of the team. She's right. just there all the time. So why wouldn't she be there? And it was a reminder of the decision he had to make to keep her safe and do that. But yeah, I, I think it was good that we at least got that moment where it was, she wasn't just an afterthought. She really was. She really is part of the team to him as well. Um, from there, we go back over, there's a lot of flip-flopping and normally I try to keep these in, in the same, kind of bundle these up, but we go back over to Sid's place and this is where she's, uh, Sid's playing, um, the two patrons there in the, in the bar, they're playing on the jar table and Omega's cleaning up, making snarky comments and Sid's like, Hey, you know, you're so good at this. Why don't you come in here? And sure enough, she comes in as quote, the expert and she wins the game for her. And this is when they negotiate uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, she realizes, wait a minute, you've got uh, something special here, kid. And I'm going to take advantage of that. And there's so many parallels to like so many other movies where this is done. I've seen everything from uh, Rain Man to, you know, the color of money and hustling people and right. uh, so many great other parallels. Uh, but it, I think it makes sense. I mean, I, is there, let me, let's just pull the, the bandaid off on this one we know later on that she ends up winning tons of money and she's a, a natural, she's gifted at this. And this is kind of her, her special thing, but strategy, right? Yeah. Strategy. So is, is it really just the strategic element? And the follow-up to that is, do you think we saw elements of that, that we didn't really pay attention? Cause I haven't, I've not had a chance to go back. I want to go back and watch some of the moments where she kind of made these um, uh, very conscious decisions that kind of turn the tide, if you will, like the shot against crosshair and a couple other ones. And to see if maybe there was something tactical about all of that, that on the surface we were not seeing because we were so hyper-focused on, oh, it's a, a, you know, a physical ability that we're going to see demonstrated, you know, with what she does and not necessarily, you know, physically rather than, you know, what she does strategically, if that makes sense. I haven't had a chance to go back and look at that, but what do you think that um, those powers are and to what extent do you think that's going to go? I think that remains to be seen. We've got to see just how strict, I mean, doing Jajaric, and saying you're really good at strategy, but Jajaric is one thing. I think applying that to a variety of other aspects, especially combat, is a little bit different. Mm. But it is curious, though, and I, I like that Hunter challenges her at the end of the episode. And of course, we don't get to see any of it to see what happens, but I have a feeling she's probably going to win. But do you think we'll actually, I, don't know, I'll, I'll, I won't ask that question yet, but I, I don't remember anything from the previous episodes where she was the critical strategic, you know, fulcrum for lack of a better word that 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 special piece that was missing that she brought that strategic element in order to push the tide their way or to swing the pendulum just a little bit in their favor so they could actually accomplish something mm -hmm. there's been little moments here and there i think that she's done something but was it something strategic or more reactionary i, I would tend to believe they're a little more reactionary if someone remembers a little bit different we'd love to see it in the chat of course uh, but that's where i was at with it but it is interesting that she had so much confidence with this and that this is her thing and you know why is this coming up just now is interesting but i think it's a i think it's something to see how this gets applied in the next several episodes to see if this really is something and again this is where i'm a bit confused though and, and maybe you can help me or maybe we're just going to wait if she is a pure copy of Django, you know was Django all that strategic and things like that i don't know that we've necessarily seen a lot of that with him we don't really have that story we certainly don't necessarily see it with Boba because, man, that guy was all sorts of things as a kid, at least, or as at this stage of his life, he's still getting there. But it just seems like a bit of a, you were talking like, what's the power? The power of strategy, I guess, is 
something, but that's not overly exciting. Is it? No. Well, no, it can't be, it can't be the only thing, right? I, I don't. Yeah. I don't, you know, I hope her power isn't the Jarek plane. Like, <laughs> right. She's really good at that. Table. She's, she's going to challenge the emperor. And <laughs> the, <laughs> that's going to turn Yeah. Win the war that that's way. Right. That's right. Uh, no, I don't think it's that. Um, so there are um, a couple things, I guess. One, it, um, I don't, uh, on the surface, it may be as simple as being able to see something and solve something quickly. All right. Yeah. So maybe if giving, if someone gives her a battle map and says, here are all the pieces, here's where everybody sits, and someone needs to assess this and make a decision about what the best approach would be, maybe there's something there where she can just, again, she can just take something and solve it and it can be kind of anything. And, and she probably is, you know, gets better at it the more she does it right or quickly, or she's got a, an apt ability to, to kind of pick it up faster than the average person from that regard. So, cause it right. didn't sound like she had any previous experience playing the game. It looked like she had just been an observer as she was cleaning, watching, picking up, understanding, figuring out the game on her own and then going, Oh, I've already figured this out. I know exactly how to play this game now and, and do all that. So maybe that's the ability, which I think would be awesome because that has, you could apply that in a lot of different scenarios, uh, right? It opens up a lot of different ways for her to, to kind of be uh, much more effective as a team member. In my head, my, my fanboy over the top, I'd love to see her like having, you know, putting cameras on all of them and going alien style where you can, she's got a, you know, a grid, a, HUD, a heads up display where she sees everybody's movements and has a map and she's calling the shots about enter now, go you there, that what I mean. That would be really cool to see having a, a kid do all of that. And I think of something like Ender's Game uh, mm -hmm. is it probably the closest. If you've ever read that book, you know, the main character Ender is, is, that, is just that. Strategically, it's very similar. He starts off playing games and he's a natural at all this stuff and he's recognized for that. And so they bring him over. I'm going to get into Ender's Game now. Mm -hmm. They bring him into um, uh, some it's like a galactic uh, uh, force, a uh, space force kind of thing, and they're fighting aliens. And so they pit these kids and they put them in these situations where they teach them the basics of strategy and because of their abilities, because of Ender's ability, he's able to do things that have no one's ever thought about except for one other person. And so from that perspective, it would be cool if this was more of like an Ender's game thing. And that's exactly what happens. He ends up kind of commanding and calling shots for this war that's happening. Although he's not in the war itself, he's just, he can see it all. Um, so in my head, again, fanboy in there, uh, sorry for, for that, but that would be really cool because I, I, it's like one of my favorite books ever. And I think it would be a neat approach because I don't think we've ever had anything like that, except maybe the High Republic with <laughs> Avar Chris. But, oh, there you go. She's Avar Chris reincarnated. There you go. Right. No, I'm kidding. But it, but it does lead questions to what were the Kaminoans doing, right? Or the Kaminoans, mm -hmm. whichever one it goes. Kaminoans. Yeah. So it's a, it's a question about what they were doing because strategy can be taught, sure. right? Yeah. And we know that she was doing you know, medical analysis and things like that. So it, being analytical is something that she's definitely been exposed to, I think, and that has had experience with. It, it, it suggests at least at that, at that way. Right. But it is curious, like, what were the Kamenau ones doing? What was, what was her purpose? And were they experimenting with her or doing other things as well to enhance something along her path? Now, granted, Tech said that she was pure. So there's, uh, there's some at odds with, with that kind of theory, but it's curious to watch it. And again, they've got six episodes to kind of figure, wrap all this stuff up in a sense and tell us why Omega really is this important to warrant all of this attention and to warrant all the Cantina cast discussion and debate. <laughs> we're we're going to send Dave a note, Dave Filoni, and just say, hey, we spent a lot of time doing this. Right. You're taking up time here. Better be a payoff, son, or we're going to have to file a complaint. Yep. He's going to tell you, yes, there will be a payoff. It'll be in season four. Right. Of the but, or we'd be like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's a little long to wait. Yeah. I mean, again, I get it. It's not the most sexy thing. It's not the most exciting thing on the surface. But, you know, if that's the case, if that's the path they go down, there are ways to make it that way. Um, so it, we'll see. I I don't know if they're going to wrap all that up in six episodes. I don't think they'll maybe there won't be an opportunity for it. And maybe they just explicitly say here it is. And that's what gives us another thing to look forward to in season two. Should they do a season two? Who knows? Or maybe she pops up later down the road and any right. one or number of the episode or series that people have uh, already predicted that she would pop up in. Uh, but the big takeaway here is the, the cut. She said something like 30 to six, somewhere they landed in a 30 to 60% range. And so this plays heavily yeah. a little bit later because this is what ultimately breaks them free 
of uh, working for Sid. They they have the opportunity at the end of this episode to to not be a part. This of is that. actually what I liked. Yeah, Sid says you get a thirty percent cut, and Omega is thinking sixty percent, mm-hmm. and she had like kind of this wry grin on her face, and Sid was like. Yeah, I don't really have much negotiating power here. So, <laughs> right. Sid, you know, Sid's a businesswoman or a business trandoshan, whatever yes. you'd like to call her. At, at the end of the day, so it made a lot of sense, and it sounds like they did really well. Uh, Rob said that droid assistant sounded a lot like L three. Yes, she did. Was it Phoebe who voiced the droid? Uh, it was not Phoebe Waller Bridges. It was uh, something Clifford. Yeah. Some- but she was very, very, very similar though, and very mm-hmm. in this the spirit of it. I, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was great. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, sorry, it's no one. Maybe Boba knows something uh, and is protecting her. Oh my goodness, the Boba Fett theories are abound right now, and we still may see him. I'm not. Yep. I'm not putting it out. I'm not leaving it out of there. Uh, it's. I think it's still on the table. But uh, let's get back to this. Is that moment where they kind of storm the wine cellar of all places, which I thought was cool. I was like, wow, they've got their own label of wine there. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was the thing that, and this is really a small thing, but I was like, oh, cool. There's an interrogation droid. But then I thought, okay, so what have they interrogated him for? Like, what is it they want to know? And I don't think we ever got the answer because the droid comes in, we get you know shades of episode four, and they come in and rescue him. But I thought, what? Any thoughts? And in- well, yeah, no, and this is actually the question. This is the real question of the week. We're going to throw out there a little later in the week, because yeah, she comes in there and says we're going to learn. You know, they want to learn what his what his secrets are. But I was like, what? And they, and they didn't <laughs> and they didn't say what it was. And I'm like, okay, what am I? All right, let's yeah. think about this. What would a senator have? You know, that is important for the CIS at this point. Is it a store of droids? Is it a resistance unit? Is it I don't know the 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 codes to the to the Jedi neutron bomb. I, I don't know what it is, and I just want them to tell me what it is because I, I, just, I think it was the uh, the secret techniques that were used used to age the wine, the grapes that were used in making the wine in the oh, cellar. That's why like, they were there, so they could apply it to clones. Maybe <laughs> we age clones like we age fine wines. <laughs> Are they going to do a Skywalker label like uh, old uh, George Lucas there? I don't know. And charge you triple for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's yeah, a fine label though. I like the logo. It is nice. I like it. Uh, I don't like the price tag. It was, uh, but it was a, it was an interesting, it's something interesting debate. That's why we wanted to throw out there just uh, on social media. We'll do that later this week. And you, everyone can kind of give us their, their two cents on that one of what, what would the center to be holding? What would he know? Or is he already seeing pockets of the, again, like a resistance and the rebellion and, is he part of, you know, Bail Organa's group or growing group? Uh, you know, have we have we already seen these connections of old enemies now, seeing that they have interests aligning, or, you know, and w- what is that? So it's it's something that could be really debated. Did anything come to mind for you, or is it no, really I'll just completely it, nebulous? Nebulous, and maybe it's just part of standard operating procedures now, right? If there's somebody who is against the Empire, their first step one says take them, interrogate them. Find Figure out what, what you know. know about them. It may not be anything, but everything is important at this point, you know? So it could just be as general as that, but I just, it sounded like a, it sounded, it made it, they made it kind of a big deal. So maybe that somebody just really wanted to get an interrogation droid in, <laughs> into the series and they thought, okay, here's, here's the opportunity. Let's draw it up. <clears throat> but and what's, they, they and what's left disapp- it. Right. What's disappointing about that, but at the end of the episode, I know we're jumping around a little bit, you know, so it just kind of walks them back, says, okay, let's talk about payment. So it doesn't really seem like we are going to see this good senator in the next episode. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. No, yeah, it, I don't. I think he's one and done. We, we've seen the the titles of some of the upcoming episodes and it's difficult to see where there's any connection with, with the storyline, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, the whole escape happens at this point. Um, so Echo, Wrecker, they all kind of meet up again. They, uh, this is where they do the harpoon line. They zip line down onto that walker. Uh, which every time I see those now, I think of Rebels and yeah. Gregor. Where, where's and the platform? I, you know, it's missing the platform and the fishing line and everything else that they were using. But they um and uh, they take over one of the walkers pretty quickly, which I thought was kind of cool because it's like okay, these guys, if anybody would know the weak points and and how to how to get one of these or commandeer one of these, it's it's gonna be them. Mm-hmm. So that all made sense. Uh, but this is where that other walker just kind of appears magically, and no one here to come and. Uh, on them i hadn't really thought about that but i think that's funny um and that other walker kind of gets a, a shot off as it kind of the as theirs gets around the corner 
and disables it. And so they're, they're kind of put in a predicament where they've got to manually start this. They've got to push it, get out and push, if you will. Uh, which I thought was funny too. I love how manual, like we have to fix this manually. And what that means is tech needs to pull out his device and <laughs> stare at the walker while he punches buttons in. I like how that's manual calibration and everything else. Cause this was exactly what happened with the, with the transponder code, I believe. Right. Yes. Back a few episodes ago, you had to get out and manually do it, rip it all out and then just do some data stuff. On yeah. It. No, it's, it's all fine. I mean, we're poking fun at it, but it is, it, we get it. It, it makes for good car. It makes for a good cartoon, um, in suspense, but, right. but I mean, yeah, no, when they said they, manually, I'm like, what do you mean? This thing yeah, weighs they, like eight me- metric tons. What are you going to do? They blew a hole in your back end. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Where are you going to go stop by Walmart, pick up some parts? Yeah. <laughs> Quick oil change folks. Get the jack out. We'll get That's this. right. We just, just need to flush the transmission fluid. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, uh, tech stays behind with echo. This is where they go through that whole process of doing that. Uh, but what was really cool is it did, and this is where I'm like, I don't really care. I mean, yeah, we'll make fun of it, but at the end of the day, it gave us an opportunity to see Hunter and Wrecker work together. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was awesome. I and mean, they're sliding around doing stuff, working off of each other. I like when Hunter takes awesome. that, yeah. uh, hits them on the head with the hatch first and then slams that, <laughs> uh, grenade down in there. I mean, it was all really good stuff to kind of see them do something and really be, uh, you know, effective as a, as a little team there. So and more than anything, really, that was that was the big payoff for me. Yeah, and I thought it was fun that we got to see Tech actually leading the charge. He was the first down the down the line shooting the you know shooting the stuns Stun. out there. Yeah, well, we actually got a, a good shot of it. We'll see later in the week through some of the advertising for social media, but it was really cool to see Tech kind of leading the way. We haven't really seen him shoot stuff before. I don't think. Nah, he's not. He's more of a lover, not a fighter. He's yeah, he's a bookworm. But yeah, he's a he's got his head in his mobile device. Right. <laughs> Remind me, it reminds me of the old like uh you know the old football games with the red dots that go around uh, Coleco, yeah Coleco yeah, football yeah, yeah. And television yeah. football yeah Ooh. um <clears throat> so and then the uh and some more and more stormtroopers are starting to show up this is where tech and echo are you know they get surprised from behind and there was a little bit in there uh, earlier on where there was a, a vase uh a, yeah. a vase priceless as we know it here in in the u.s uh, happy Fourth of July, by the way. Uh, but they're uh, you know they keep the vase and they make a joke about it. Well, it, it comes into play here because I think it's Singh chucks that vase at somebody to, as a distraction at one of the stormtroopers, and that allows Echo and and uh, Tech to kind of get the upper hand on them. Right. Yeah, the droid it, saved it. Yeah, the droid saved it. Has been carrying it around the rest of the this entire episode. episode. Yes. And then if you listen, if you go back, I didn't I didn't hear it, but if you put the uh, uh, subtitles on the droid yells out Senator like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you mm-hmm. just did that. I thought it was hilarious because it's so it's subtle. You can barely hear it in the background, but she's upset that he tossed it after she'd been okay. lugging that thing around. Cause she thought it was something that was important to him. And he was like, yeah, I didn't really care for it much anyways. Oh, uh, anyways, they get their walker up and running. And then this is where it gets a little precarious. Cause Singh tells him, Hey, you, we need to head over there into that dead end area. And all of them are like, mm, this is it. This is where that other shoe is going to fall, uh, you know, uh, drop. And, uh, you know, I, he's like, hey, you got to trust me. Um, you know, we're kind of all in this together kind of thing. And so they do. And uh, I thought it was a really good, effective strategy. I like the idea of, of backing that thing up, blowing a hole in the side and escaping through it. And then blowing and then Hunter or sorry, Wrecker blows up as a walk out. He ensures that that rubble comes down and covers him up. And so it's a pretty much a clean getaway. And now they're down in the you know, the sewers or whatever, or the underworld right. of, of, uh, Raxus at that point. But yeah, but and by the time they get all the wreckage out of the way to find out where they're at, they're long gone. They're long gone. Yeah. No way to track them. So yeah, it was a good move. Yeah. Um, so they get away and this is where Singh right before they, they we kind of cut over to the, the forest Singh's about to jump on. And then he realizes like, Hey, this doesn't feel right. I can't, I shouldn't be just leaving my people, which I, I would expect him to have felt especially since, uh, you know, we, he, he seemed like he was all about his people. Now he's just going to leave them there. And right. yeah, that's gotta be a horrible sinking feeling, but of all people, it's echo that comes forward and says, Hey, you know, you need to live to fight another day. And, uh, you know, so now not only did we have echo kind of go through this whole character development phase of, you know, trusting people he would have never trusted, but now he's bestowing wisdom and part, you know, per, uh, on them, uh, in hopes that they're going to be able to, in, in trusting them to do more with that a little bit later. It's kind of a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like the fact that it, of all people, it was Echo. I will say this, though, in the audio descriptions, it says it was Hunter. And so I'm sure. wondering if that was originally going to be Hunter and they switched it and made it Echo. I think it's more powerful. It's coming from Echo, given he was the one that was constantly saying, hey, 
you know, these are separatists. What are we doing here? So yeah, and maybe I got it wrong. Uh, it could be that that was hundred percent right. I thought they showed Echo's helmet. I think both him and Hunter were in frame though. So maybe I just looked at the mm. wrong character. I thought it was Echo. Anyway. Well, it, it was Echo. Matter. No, it was Echo that said it. Oh, okay. I think the audio description either got it wrong or they made a zero hour change or they changed it before they updated the audio description. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, which I, I, what I'm saying is I think it was better coming from Echo. And uh, oh, absolutely. Like yeah. yeah. I mean, Hunter wasn't on board with it either. So it works both ways. Right. And then, yeah, Chef Chris is telling us it was definitely Echo as well. So, all right. We have a consensus. Yep. We're, we can move on at this point. <laughs> So we get back to Sid's and they arrive and they hear all this cheering and stuff coming out of Sid's bar, which is unusual given that place is a freaking ghost town. There's like <laughs> never anybody but those two dudes in there. And it's, uh, it's fitting that Omega was accused of killing the vibe around the bar. Yeah, right. And now she's 100% responsible yeah, for the vibe, going, yep. bringing life back to it. Yeah. And I, I'm going to say this too. This is not in our show notes. So don't, don't get worried here, Jonesy. But there, uh, I want everybody to go back and count the number of goat goatans, mm -hmm. the uh, the race that looks like a goat. There's an over usage of goatans in this whole <laughs> series. In this episode alone, there were two different ones. There was at least one in the last episode. There's one in the premiere. But go back and I've, I'm going to go count them all. But I think with the exception of one, maybe two episodes, there has been a goatan in every episode, and it's the same character model. Like, I don't, it's the same clothing, the same, it's white. Uh, it's got the two black fingers. It's bizarre. I don't know what, what the deal is there, but I thought, okay, well, maybe there's, maybe they're hiding this one in there and it's like an Easter egg or something, but there is a, an excessive use of Gotans. So. Yeah, now, now Dave's going to get two letters from us yes. this week. Yes. What God. is up with all the Gotans? <laughs> We've got a investation of Gotans. <laughs> investation you know, of, of Gotans. Uh, but yeah, so they come in there, Omega's playing some blue skin person. Uh, I don't know what species that was. I thought maybe sure it was a are. chiss, but they don't have all the facial paint stuff on them uh, like that. But either way, we the the point is she gets one over on this guy and, and wins uh, a ton of money and everybody's cheering them on or cheering her on. Uh, but Hunter is like kind of upset because he said, keep a low profile and this is anything but a low profile. And now they've got all this unwanted attention on her because everybody knows in the area that she's some kind of phenom when it comes to Dejaric or strategy or whatever else. But the good news is Sid tells them that she's earned enough money to pay off their debt. So I guess at this point, they have every reason to leave because they've got unwanted attention and they're no longer indebted to her. So right. maybe this is the time that they uh, they go and, and, and move on. But do you think that's going to happen? And we can just kind of wrap it up with that. Do you think this is the point where we're going to get away from SIDS and are they going to go meet up with Echo, meet up with who? Or Rex, yeah. Yeah, Rex or something. Sorry, Echo Rex, yeah. That's good. I mean, it's a good point because I think now, like you said, there's no, there's nothing to bind them to it. I think they still need money though, right? I mean, just because they have their debt clear doesn't mean that they've actually True. earned anything extra. Maybe this job has earned them something. So maybe that would be, that would be fair to apply that. But they still need money and resources, and they've got someone that they can reasonably trust and that is going to not sell them out, at least until their usefulness is you know, outlived, I guess. But I don't think she sees that. She's got a mercenary force here that can go get a lot of things done. And she's got someone who can help you know, clean the kitchen while they're away on, on a mission, too. Mm -hmm. So it's something I think that Sid's probably all too happy for them to hang around. But I, I kind of think that we probably start venturing away. I think this is the time to venture away from SIDS, right? We don't necessarily need home base being on, on Ord Mantel. It's okay for this to go back to the Havoc Marauder or something like that to where we we are a bit more mobile, right? And when we, we don't work a little more autonomous with where we're at, we don't have to be hamstrung back to a certain place every time. Although it would be a way to get back with Rex because they all know where they're, they can meet up at, I guess. But I, yeah, I, I think it's time for us to move beyond Sid. I think she can still come up and, and be a resource, kind of like she was last week. She was just a, a passing comment, but yeah. it doesn't mean they have to turn her back on, on Sid or anything like that. But uh, what about you? Do you think this is now it's time to break free of, of that group? Um, I mean, I, I, we, got our, we got a few episodes out of it, and we, we talked about that kind of being a mission hub now, uh, for, for lack of a better term. That's a right. video game term. It, it felt like that, um, and I think it worked. They were able to kind of balance that without feeling like a mission hub. Um, 
So with six episodes left, is that right? Six? Yeah. Yep. Six back. You think about it, normally they create these in like three story arcs. It makes sense. I mean, I, if they left, I wouldn't be upset. Uh, to your point, she can still be around. She can be a resource that comes in and helps them out at some point at the very end there as a, you know, she already showed, demonstrated that she was good with the blaster or the bow and arrow. So she's got some kind of uh, war experience or you know, something in, in her background. So I think they could they could uh, still bring her in here. And if not, I mean, they just table her and she becomes, you know, an asset for them going forward or an asset for, uh, you know, the, the Rebel Alliance or what will soon be the, the Rebel Alliance. So yeah. that may be something, too, if if the Empire starts catching on that Sid's been helping them and while they're away, they take her and all of a sudden she has to be indebted to the Bad Batch at some point, too. Mm -hmm. It would be a bit cliche, but it would be, uh, it would work as, at the at the same time. Yeah. There's, uh, but there are a lot of things that we still have to figure out, right? It's a lot of things we still need to wrap up. Uh, we've got, uh, obviously, Crosshair, Crosshair is still yeah. out there. Uh, we've toyed with the idea of liberating or somehow freeing the clones. Maybe it happens this season, maybe it doesn't, maybe it never happens, but that's going to, it feels like that's going to take a little bit of runway to build up to. So they may need six episodes to get that out of, to get all that uh, done. I feel like Saul Guerrero has still got a, an opportunity to come back here. Mm -hmm. um, he seems to be... Rex, giving yeah. a lot of grief to them. Yep. We've got Rex. Uh, we've got potentials for special guest stars like Ahsoka and, and, and some of the other folks. Uh, not to give anything away, but there's a good chance that we may see somebody like Harris and Dula in this one coming up very soon. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And, that, and I, all I say, and I'm like, I know nothing about that. All I'm saying is one of the titles that's coming up leads me to think, oh, wait a minute, I know who's on that planet or I know who's been there and it could very well lead to that. So I think there's still enough story here that if we broke away, it's fine because there's still a lot of stuff that they need to get to. And I'd rather focus on that than have to be kind of tethered to uh, the Sid mission hub kind of location. So I, I could go either way, I guess. Yeah, and one other thing to kind of go back to Hunter and Omega as this episode you know, wrapped up, Wrecker like, gives him a nudge when he walks by when, when the, you know, the place clears out and uh, Sid is informing him that, you know, he, she's taking care of all of their debt and all of that record gives him like this, you know, bumps into him and nudges his arm mm -hmm. and gives him this look. And you, you have to kind of look for the look, but it's there of like, hmm? you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a wide eyed face people who are just listening to where it's like, you, you need to talk to her, do it. Don't chicken out, you know, you know, eat your pride and, and just yep. go and tell her, you know, she did well, basically, and, and he appreciates what she's done. And yeah. It, I, and his way of doing that was, so you think you're good at strategy? Well, let's have a game. And if you beat me, then it won't be a question anymore. You will be on the, every single mission with us after the fact. You can earn your way into that, you know, and, and kind of prove your worth in that respect. Which I think it was interesting because we've always considered Hunter a bit more the strategic thinker of the group anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he has a kind of like natural leader. Uh, ability, but in, in Omega, you know, she tells him I felt helpless and I don't, and I think that's what, that was probably the last thing he was trying to make her feel right. That she was helpless or not useful in any way. It's just at the end of this episode, I think he's come to realize, okay, that was not a good decision. And I regret it. She should have, she would have completely been able to hold her own. We could have used her on the mission. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of that was kind of running through his head. I took that whole match at the very end as a, there's no way I'm going to win this. I don't think he was going into it thinking he was going to win. Um, I think he was just looking at it as an opportunity for her to kind of get one up on him, get back at him and kind of, you know, make him eat his own words in, in that way. But it was also was maybe a test to see what she, what were the big, you know, fuss was about. And it's that olive branch too, right? Mm -hmm. Of let's sit down and have a game then. And, and you could show me what you, what you've got. You could show, like, to, you know, along the lines of where you were going and just show me how good you are and, and, Give the opportunity to the to the kid that says, "Okay, see if you can beat your old man." Right? You know, and regardless of whether she does or doesn't, I think it's an opportunity for them to at least have that bonding moment of sorts that he will he will respect her enough to give her those opportunities going forward. Yeah, I, and I think this. I mean, I I think we're done. I don't think this is. I think we're this is finally the nail in the coffin of whether or not Omega stays behind. I, I think at this point she's done more than enough on her own to prove that she's not helpless and that she is a part of the team and she can be useful in a lot of different ways. And couple that with the fact that, you know, he's acknowledging that he, I think he's acknowledging that he didn't make the best decision there. I think we're, 
I don't think we're going to go back to that, which was the problem when I said earlier on this episode, I felt like we regressed a little bit and I kind of understood why, but I don't think we're going to have that again. I think she's in uh, at this point going forward uh, until something tears them apart or. Yeah. And you know, earlier in this, earlier in the show, you were saying we were trying to figure out if we had a moment where Omega had kind of a strategy type of moment. You remember back with the, the beast that chewed on energy. I can't remember what it was. One of the very first, you know, that was maybe an example of some of that where she had to observe the behaviors of what it was interested in, what it needed, and then come up with a quick plan in order to, you know, get the, whatever the power cell or whatever it was called uh, and distract the animal so she could get out of there. So maybe that was one example. Hmm. Yeah. I, um, I think I, I really do hope it's kind of high level, just being able to analyze something and come up with a quick strategy and right. a plan on the fly. That would be kind of neat. There's, I think there's some good uses of that that they could implore or deploy here in a deploy yep. in, in future episodes. Agreed. Um, all right. So I think we've covered all the final thoughts. Uh, I guess, where do we go from here? We've already talked about that. We talked about the debt being paid off. Um, and, uh, I guess the big burning question is, do you think they go to Rex at this point? Hmm. Do they need to go to Rex at this point? No, I don't think they do. I don't think so. I mean, again, we don't really know what Rex is fighting for or who he's with either, but maybe this would be an opportunity. I, I'm, I'm on the fence about whether I want to go back to Rex, to be honest with you. I love Rex so much. And I think this is such an interesting place of his journey, but I, I just don't, I think we end up having to go back to Rex at some point because there is some unresolved, you know, Hey, we'll help you. You help us. Uh, but maybe another, maybe another couple of episodes away here. Yeah. Well, and don't forget, they left it open. They both said, Hey, you call me if you need anything and I'll call you if I need anything. So absolutely. <clears throat> it could be Rex coming to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I don't think they would say no if he did at this point either. I mean, they, they're in a good opportunity. They're in a good position right now to kind of make a decision about what they want to do on their own. Um, so who knows? Maybe she made enough money that they don't need any money now, they, including, you know, they've gotten the Rax's mission. That seemed like it was a pretty big payoff uh, yeah. for rescuing uh, Senator Singh, plus the money that Omega made. Maybe they do have enough in their coffers to kind of say, okay, we're, we're we've got enough to head out and do our own thing or... Rex comes knocking on the door and they say, yeah, we're in, yeah, let's go. We'll, we'll help you out here. Cause it's going to give us purpose and direction again. Who knows? Yeah. I think we're going to, my thoughts around Rex is going to be, you know, how he was introduced to us before is kind of a the shadowy figure on the, on the, the hologram. I think it'd be something similar. He shows up at the end of an episode and it leads us into the next one. It, yeah. It's just, it's pretty cliche, but it, it works. It's pretty powerful to do it that way. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Chef Chris, we need more bow action. Yeah, I agree. We I do. want to see Sid in action, though. I really do want to see her. And I, every time you say it, I, I don't have much reaction to it because I just don't want to get my hopes up. But I definitely want to see what she's capable of doing. Yeah. Because you just know she's got to have some sort of skill. Yes. It'd be awesome if she used to be a bounty hunter or something like that herself. That would be awesome. I like that idea. Trandoshan bounty hunters. Yeah. Pretty cool. I don't know if you've yeah. been keeping up with those guys. Or not. I don't know if they've ever had one do it before. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking maybe female, but no, I think there was one in in legends as well. Um, and then we've had Trandoshan Jedi as well. Yep, exactly. Skier. Skier. Well, uh, no, we had, well, we had others in legends. We've had too. other ones too. Yeah. yeah but that yeah, was the one that too. comes to mind. So, all right. Uh, I think that's going to do it. I mean, we got, uh, through this pretty good hour and a half considering we did about 20 minutes of, of news, but, uh, but overall, again, like you said, I, I felt like it was a good character development episode. We got to see them in their best moments and, um, you know, it certainly sets it, if nothing else, it at least sets it up so that, at this point, we can kind of go in any direction. It doesn't feel like they're tied down to Sid anymore. So that opens up a lot of opportunities, I think. I agree. I mean, as we're, we're getting into the home stretch of this season, I guess, at least, right? We'll just call it the, the season. Now we're, like you said, now we're free to start to set up these last four episodes, these last three or four episodes, which might be a bit more intense. And I'll have a lot more packing of, of events into it. But now we have to start moving the pieces, get into place, right? So what are the things that are going to be necessary for the, as we get towards a finale for the, for the series or for the episodes or for the, the season rather, whatever that might be. And, you know, where, do, where does everything need to be? And that'll be interesting to see how that starts to take place here. Because again, Floating and Company don't do things willy nilly. They, they usually have an intention for some of the, the seeds they've planted over time and some of the things that we've, we've seen, but not really had applied quite yet. And that's only a few things here and there. But now we need to start to see them coming together and how do they fit and where do we start to align 
all of the parts so they can actually resolve some of the things we have. And then what surprises do they have for us here in the next several episodes? Yeah, uh, this, you know, you were, as you were talking, I was thinking we're actually ending like uh, this feels like it is the, the end of the second act and we're going into the third act of the season now. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. First one is the first act being them escaping, getting, figuring out what they need to do. The second act was kind of really that whole middle part with Sid and learning who they were and working together and doing missions and all that and growing. And now they're a cohesive team. I think for the most part, I, I felt like maybe tech and um, echo still need some resolution there. They need to work some things out, but for the most part, I would say they're kind of a good working team. They've all know their roles now at least. And again, they're ready to move on. So I think we are going to kind of come around the corner at this point and go into this big finale. So I wouldn't put it past them to put some big stuff in these last six episodes at this point. Yeah, and I think this is always the part we get a little concerned about. As you get ramped up for those last, you know, several episodes, you these middle ones here, you know, if, if we're six out, you know, these lat, these two or three here, are they, do they start to feel like filler? And I think some people have had some criticisms of of whether or not we're already at that point as you get to this mid-season. And you get the, the high of the mid-season finale, but on the other side of it, you know, it gets a little softer. And again, things are moving, but they're at a more deliberate pace, a little bit slower pace. So are we, you know, is it something that we need to, are we going to get this criticism again where we're, things are moving slower than what we, we wanted to? So I think temper expectations here for the next couple of episodes, because I think that's always the risk is things are, I use the word deliberate very well, deliberately, because they have to plot certain things out and they want to build certain aspects. So as long as they all fit together, I think we, we need, we can be patient and we can get that payoff that we're hoping for and that we, that we expect to get as we get to the last several. Yep. Um, the over under on Gotans is uh, pretty high. Yeah. Probably so, 22 at this point. Yeah, for sure. In the last six episodes. In fact, that whole last episode is going to take place on the home planet of Gotans. So yes. just get ready for it. Yeah. It's All right. Sith, Sith apprentices of Gotans. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who, for coming on to the live recording tonight. Uh, been a lot of talk, a lot of chatter, good interaction, and uh, great comments. Thank you for your help, too. Uh, and Jonesy, do you want to kind of pitch the um, the Patreon stuff and where they can find us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, patreon.com slash the Cantina cast. You will find everything we've done out there. We've got a few tiers for you. A uh, dollar if you want to just support the show. We've got the After Dark tier, which opens you up to majority of what we got. Uh, both in the past and what we're doing now. And then we've got the the green milk tier, which I, we've still not renamed. It's the $5 tier. Again, this is all a month there. Someone actually reached out to us and said that they were very nominal in value. And that was this really intentional for us. I and mean, we've explored some other things, but we want this stuff to be accessible for people and we're not doing it to make tons of money, right? We're, well, we're not going to make tons of money at this because this is just for fun, right? And so... Everything we earn gets put right back into the show, but it's supposed to be low for everybody to be able to enjoy it because we want as many people to hear, you know, all the things that Albert has to say as much as possible. We'll go dance. Yeah, we're going to have a Gotan specific episode here. That might be a $50 <laughs> tier. We're getting greedy now, folks. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, so you, you can find all that on, on patreon.com slash the cantina cast, eargluemedia.com slash discord. If you want to check us out there and check out all the amazing shows, that we've got on the early media network. We've got whiskey, we've got screen, we've got history, uh, film history, we've got film appraisers, we've got all sorts of fantastic uh, stuff coming up. Eerglymedia.com, if you want to see all the amazing shows that we got, you can listen to them right from there as well. And, and if they have a live stream, you can actually click and watch the videos right in there as well. So we'd love to see more people show up. Uh, again, appreciate everybody who's been signing up. We've had this really nice steady stream of uh, people reaching out and subscribing to YouTube as well. So make sure that you're subscribing and hitting the bell to make sure that you are notified whenever we are get ready to post another or whenever we get ready to go live again. Yeah. Uh, also, if you get a chance to, if you've not had a chance to drop us a few good words on Apple um, iTunes and leave a review, please do so. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, those are always great to have in our back pocket. So thanks for doing that. If you do. Yeah, or, or wherever you listen to your shows. Yeah. App, Apple's of course kind of the main one, but Wherever you do, if you have a chance to review us, please do. We we do see all of them, I think, or most of we them. We do. We see most of them. Yeah, just right. we don't see the bad ones because we just delete those. So, man, you're so. I know some people. Some people believe that, man. No, we don't do that. <laughs> we don't. I don't have the power to no. do that. We have. We like constructive criticism as well, but you can just ping us on Discord with those. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't leave us a one star review. We love you, folks. We appreciate everything. 
All right, we're going to get out of here. Uh, I updated the Patreon outro finally. I tweaked the audio finally. Everybody's updated, so you'll get to see your name on there. I guess we'll see you guys on the next episode um, for episode uh, 378. That's just crazy, though. You're still listening? Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, We talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 